updates from the field. For those of you who don't know me or may not recognize me, I'm Professor Ellert. I am a visiting associate professor of environmental and energy law and fellow here at GW. And I just wanted to say I'm very excited and looking forward to this discussion. But before we begin, just wanted to remind everyone to keep themselves muted as others are talking. And you're encouraged to leave your camera on during the duration of the discussion. If you have any questions for our panelists, please type them into the chat and we'll do our best to get to them or drop a queue in the chat and we'll call on you so you can ask your question directly to our prestigious panelists. This event is brought to you in part by GW's Environmental and Energy Law Program, GW Student Chapter of the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and the GW Law's American Constitution Society. Before I turn things over to our moderator for today, a reminder that this discussion will be recorded and shared online, so be sure to follow GW's Environmental Injury Law Program on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn and to keep up with the latest news and events. And if uh, you are a student interested in this and related topics, be sure to become a member of GW Student Animal Legal Defense Fund and the American Constitutional Society. I will now hand things over to our moderator, Michael Swistara, who will introduce our panelists and kick things off. Michael is a fourth year law and public policy student focusing on animal protection, environmental law and social justice. He is the president of GW Law Student Animal Legal Defense Fund chapter, an emerging, an emerging scholars fellow at the Brooks Institute for Animal Rights, Law and Policy and student chair of the ABA's Animals and Agriculture Subcommittee. Thank you, Professor Ellerts, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for being here. I'm really excited for this panel. So let me go ahead and introduce our three expert speakers that we have today. Uh, Alan Chen is the Thompson G. Marsh Law Alumni Professor at Denver Sturm College of Law, a former ACLU attorney. Professor Chen's area of specialization is free speech doctrine and theory. His work has been published in numerous law review articles, and he's co-authored two books on the subjects of public interest lawyering and uh, free speech. In addition to teaching, Professor Chen works on active litigation, including uh, relevant to the topic today, ag gag cases in states like Idaho and Utah. Kelsey Eberly is a senior staff attorney at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Her work focuses on combating ag gag laws as well as deceptive trade practices from the animal agriculture industry, pet stores, and other industries that exploit non-human animals. Uh, she's been involved with and led many of the ALDF's ag gag lawsuits all across the country. And last but not least, David Muraskin is the Food Project Litigation Director at Public Justice. His docket ranges from constitutional law challenges to consumer, worker, and environmental cases, all focused on promoting a just and sustainable alternative to the industrial animal agriculture system. David is the lead counsel on multiple ag ag lawsuits and is an adjunct professor of food and agriculture law here at GW Law, which you can all take this coming spring. The topic of the panel today is ag ag laws. What are they? What challenges do they present? And how is the field changing in response to wins by advocates? So maybe let's start by setting the stage for any of the three of our, our panelists who want to chime, chime in on this. What is an ag ag law? What does that term mean? And how did these laws start getting passed? Where did they come from? Thanks, um, I can kick that off. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be um, here and talk with you about this very, very important and timely subject. Um, so an ag ag law is basically any statute, state statute that criminalizes or punishes um, or creates civil, civil liability for whistleblowing, undercover investigations, um, and undercover reporting uh, activities inside factory farms, slaughterhouses, animal facilities, and as we'll kind of go on to talk about more, um, really these laws have come to apply to a broad swath of industries even beyond um, animal, you know, factory farms and, and slaughterhouses and other animal facilities. And these laws really, you know, the story of ag gag laws really begins um, sort of in the late 1980s um, with the rise of animal activism in the United States and the sort of increasing um, characterization of animal and environmental um, activists as kind of eco-terrorists or animal terrorists. And so the sort of earliest um, ag-gag laws that sort of sought to um, suppress animal activism arose in the early 90s, starting with Kansas. And um, 
uh, Montana and North Dakota also passed sort of very early versions of these ag-gag laws, although they weren't called that at the time. Um, and then many years went by and um, animal activism started to um, you know, grow in the United States um, and to particularly rely on um, what have sort of become the, the characteristic um, form of advocacy that is targeted by ag-ag laws. And those are employment-based undercover investigations. So basically um, a person you know, sent by an animal protection group will get a job at a slaughterhouse or a, um, a factory farm and while doing their job, will record and monitor, you know, what they're seeing while they go about their their responsibilities. And as a result of these investigations, you know, people saw for the first time inside these facilities, and um, were sort of horrified by what they were seeing. So the investigations revealed um, rampant, you know, animal cruelty of all different types. Um, both sort of aberrant sort of animal torture, but also the cruelties of um, just standard and, you know, industry practices in the agriculture industry. Um, but the investigations also had really widespread and negative effects, you know, even beyond um, animal advocacy. So, for example, in 2012, the uh, Humane Society of the United States investigated the Hallmark Westland uh, Slaughterhouse in California and filmed um, workers dragging downed cows with forklifts and spraying them with high powered hoses. And this facility was supplying beef to the school lunch program. And the you know, publishing of this investigation resulted in the largest meat recall, meat recall in US history, prompted congressional hearings about enforcement of the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, and was really um, you know, sort of had a ripple effect throughout the entire industry. And investigations like that were happening all across the country, but particularly in you know, heavily agricultural states. So Iowa and uh, Missouri and Idaho and um, Utah. And so in response, the industry um, sort of took a shoot the messenger approach and um, in the early 2010s, um, really took a renewed interest in this phenomenon of criminalizing uh, undercover investigations and, and whistleblowing inside these facilities. And so the first sort of ag-gag law of the modern era was passed in 2012. That was the um, Iowa's uh, Agricultural Production Facility Fraud Statute. And this phrase was co coined, this phrase, the ag-gag phrase that we've you know, come to rely on was coined by um, the former New York Times columnist, Mark Bittman, when he sort of you know, was saying, he wrote this column saying, you know, getting caught is a drag. Uh, I'm sort of pointing to all these negative effects that the facilities, um, you know, suffer when um, when their practices come to light, not only animal practices, but also, you know, food safety practices and their treatment of work. Um, and so, you know, did another wave of ag-gag laws um, through the 2010s. And those are the laws that, um, that we've launched this litigation campaign against um, that we'll go on to talk more about. Thank you, Kelsey. I think that was a great sort of overview of, of where these laws came from. If either of the other two speakers want to add anything to that, feel free to go ahead. But but if not, uh, I think there's some other sort of laying the groundwork questions that we can go into. Uh, Kelsey, one thing you mentioned sort of that these target particularly undercover sort of employment based investigations. And some of you in the audience may have attended our panel two weeks ago with Mercy for Animals Special Investigations, uh, or sorry, Senior Investigation Specialist Eric Hastings, who, who spoke about the significance of these employment-based investigations. But um, could all of you, or, or at least one of you, speak to not only the role that these investigations play, but also whether there are other forms of speech or conduct that are being um, targeted or affected? Is it, is it only investigations that we're concerned about with ag laws? Well, I can I can speak a little bit to the so one 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 thing. What the next step probably should be just describing what these laws exactly do, um, and there are a variety of, of of measures that state legislatures have enacted to um, chill and punish potentially punish undercover investigations that have revealed such important information. So, um, uh, Kelsey mentioned that. A lot 
a lot of the undercover itself, an ag ag statute is one that makes it a crime to uh, to lie or engage in other type of misrepresentation about one's own identity or motives or uh, other sort of loyalties. And so investigators are obviously um, under contract with ALDF, PETA, and other organizations. And when they apply for these jobs at uh, industrial agriculture, animal ag agricultural facilities, they don't reveal that, that fact. And they don't reveal that the fact that they're there uh, not only to work, but to uh, engage in an investigation that will result in publication of information uh, that's vital to the public's concern and public, public knowledge. So some of them ban misrepresentation to gain access to an agricultural facility. Others, well, others ban uh, mis misrepresentations to gain employment with an agricultural facility. So there's sort of two versions of that. Um, and they, they obviously sometimes overlap um, in some jurisdictions, but those are the two things. But as, as Kelsey mentioned, employment-based investigations are really the key. And that's where most of the important information has been revealed uh, or the vehicle through which uh, most of the inf important information has revealed. The other thing I will say to add about the misrepresentation provisions that several states have added in a uh, requirement that the person misrepresent their identity with the intent to harm. Um, but the, uh, and, and to sort of focus on, uh, I think in my view, to focus the public's attention on the idea, well, going back to the eco-terrorism um, stereotype, you know, oh, these people are, are out to you know, burn down our barns or destroy uh, our, pro our property. Um, but the, usually the definition of harm is so broad uh, that it could include reputational harm that results from the publication of truthful information. Um, and that's what we are really focused on in this litigation saying that, you know, this is, the, these statutes are written so broadly that that type of harm resulting from the re revelation of truthful information is what the, the legislatures are really targeting and um, not, not actual physical damage. Um, a second part, a second type of ag-ag law focuses on the act of uh, photographing or video recording uh, activities on the property without the owner's express consent. And um, even though our investigators uh, or these investigators access the property through misrepresentation, so they're on the property with the knowledge of the, the uh, uh, people who run these, uh, institu these places um, but they are not, they're also recording without the express consent. So they're, what we've argued is that people who are lawfully present on these properties, uh, like a current employee or, or uh, somebody who gains access to the property in any other way, um, can't be prohibited from recording uh, if they're lawfully present because we argue that photography and video, video recording are forms of speech, uh, or at the very least, they're forms of action prior, uh, that are necessary to engage in speech. Uh, in, the, in the same uh, analogous to news gathering by reporters and other types of journalists. Um, so the, these, these bans require separately or sometimes independently ban or make it a crime to engage in photography or video recording, which of course have made the investigations more powerful because when they're posted on YouTube or other public uh, social media networks, people can really see the horrors of how these um, slaughterhouses and uh, uh, factory farms are run. Uh, and, and as Kelsey mentioned, it's not just the animals who are mistreated, although they're obviously significantly uh, severely uh, mistreated, but also the workers who are often uh, powerless and also uh, frequently undocumented workers um, in these places. So um, then there's a third category of ag, -Ag law that um, Missouri is the prime example of this, where uh, the law is put, is actually kind of clever, I think, politically, the legislature places it, uh, characterizes it as an animal protection law. Uh, but what it does is requires anybody who witnesses animal cruelty or, uh, uh, or observes any kind of animal cruelty in these um, uh, places must uh, turn over that evidence, uh, evidence of those, that cruelty within a specific amount of time, usually 24 or 48 hours. And that may sound like a pro-animal uh, protection bill because it says, oh yeah, we should, you should blow the whistle on these places. Uh, but in fact, uh, what it does is it ends up outing the investigators at a very preliminary stage. Sometimes these investigations can take weeks or even months to unfold because the workers have to have, uh, the, the investigators have to be on site long enough to document a pattern of misconduct. 
um, and can't always access every every as, uh, place in the facility. So uh, requiring them to turn over the uh, in evidence of animal cruelty within 24 or 48 hours is effectively ends the investigation. Um, and that's something that is equally problematic. Um, I think I'll let uh, David uh, maybe explain the, the another category of ag ag law. I've been talking about criminal prohibitions, um, but as Kelsey mentioned, there's also civil liability, civil liability provisions um, that we argue are equally chilling to criminal pro prohibitions. Yeah, thanks, Alan. I think so. I do think it's worth underscoring that Alan was really focused on the ag part of the ag gag part of the law, and one of the things that we've seen, and Kelsey kind of hinted at this, is that as we've gotten successes against the early ag gag laws, the states have sought to manipulate the statutes in several important ways to try to make them more bulletproof. And one of those is to get rid of the ag component. So one of our early arguments was that by focusing on speech at agricultural facilities, the laws were by definition content-based, which gets some strict scrutiny, which is you know, probably all of you have taken con law or the, you know, strict in theory, fatal in fact line that comes out around this, right? Strict scrutiny is the hardest um, method of scrutiny to get around. And so to get a, to try to beat back that strict scrutiny argument, they got rid of the ag connection. And so the later laws here are actually not just ag gag laws, they're just gag laws. So for instance, North Carolina prohibits un re recording on private property but it's not limited to agricultural facilities. It includes nursing homes, hospitals, daycare centers. And so in fact, the Wounded Warriors Project and AARP were some of the leading opponents of those laws because they were worried about elder abuse and mistreatment in hospitals not being able to be able to be documented because the laws got so broad. And don't get me wrong, these statutes are still motivated by the agricultural industry. And when we look at the legislative history, we know they're targeted at ALDF and PETA and the similar groups, but it is this kind of an attempt to manipulate the, the constitutional analysis by making them broader. And so it's very similar, you know, there's the recording component that's very similar to the original ag, -AG laws and the underlying politics is very similar. You get a, a broader statute. Then as Alan has talked about, one of the other things that we've seen is that the states have moved from criminal liability to civil liability. And that is gets specifically an attempt to do an end run around ex parte young. Um, so as many of you, again, who are probably taking con law or fed courts know, um, we can only sue state officials in certain circumstances that normally there's immunity for suing state officials unless you can kind of fall within an exception. A classic exception is if the government's violating the constitution. And there's a really poorly written Fifth Circuit decision, and right, I know that's not saying anything unique. There are plenty of poorly written Fifth Circuit decisions, but um, that there's a particularly poorly written one that suggests that ex parte young somehow doesn't have an exception for civil statutes. And I think that's blatantly a wrong reading of the law, and we, it's been repeatedly rejected. But one of the other end runs around this that we've seen is to move from criminal to civil liability and try to bring us within um, that carve out to the carve out of ex parte young. So, in other words, to make it so we can't actually respectively sue, and that's what Alan's talking about. And one other quick thought I want to emphasize is that as these laws also broaden, they focus on connecting conduct to trespass. And it's important to understand when Kelsey's talking about undercover investigations, she's talking about going into a facility, but trespass is much broader than actually going into some place. And so you get actually these laws also impacting a variety of other activists. Um, so we represented, for instance, people in Wyoming where they would be going to collect data on public land, but it turns out in Wyoming, leases are handed out randomly without any kind of really good recording and there's no fence. And so you can accidentally trespass on the way to something going across public land, getting to public land in Wyoming very easily. It happens all the time, quite frankly. And, but they were trying to stop people from gathering this information on public land by connecting it to trespass. Trespass sounds like it protects private property. No one in their right mind would think these, you know, parcels that are totally in the middle of hundreds of acres of public land are called here.
sorry, my internet cut out a little bit there. Um, hopefully I didn't miss anything or, or everyone else didn't as well. Um, but thank you so much, Alan and David, for that taxonomy of, of the different types of agate laws that we've seen in criminal and civil, because I think that's really important. And we'll get into some of those constitutional questions that you mentioned, David, about uh, the First Amendment. But first, I think anyone who knows anything about animal law will know that standing is, is a perennial challenge to animal law. So before we even get to the merits, we got to get into court. Uh, could you explain a little bit the ways that you've alleged improving standing in these cases that you're bringing when challenging ag ag laws? I think I'll, I'll kick us off here, but we all kind of wrestle with this together, and so others should drop, jump in. So I think, again, by way of laying the foundation um, to make sure we're all on the same page, the First Amendment's nice in that it has an exception to the kind of traditional standing analysis that recognizes your deterrence from speaking as an injury. So where we you know, normally think of injury as some kind of financial harm or an arrest or something like that, the, in the First Amendment, we a little bit loosen the notion of injury and standing analysis and say that if you can't yet, if you are deterred from speaking, if you're chilled in the language of the cases, that is in itself an injury in fact. And so that's really what we are anchoring almost all of our arguments around is that general principle. But then how it actually gets materialized is varies a lot and gets into several of these um, these different wrinkles in the statute. So for instance, one of the early fights that we had was the question of are, are undercover investigations so complicated that we can't actually allege chill? In other words, there are so many steps to engaging in undercover investigations that even if a person might be able to say they're chilled by like a speeding statute that is connected to speech or an anti-protest statute, undercover investigators can't. And so we had to kind of lay out the ways in which these groups are really skilled at and are able to gain and gain access that allow them to prove chill. And then the next question was, well, as they tie these uh, statutes to trespass or other conduct, these groups have to admit that they in fact are going to engage in trespass and other conduct. And in fact, I have on my computer right now, a brief about this very issue that I'm writing um, that we need to turn in later this week. Um, and that this is, you know, a classic kind of gotcha. Well, you all don't want to admit you're um, going to be prosecuted. So we're just going to say that as a result, we can't actually allege you've been chilled. And um, again, we think that has, we have a different take on that depending on the circumstances. Sometimes the government's spoken out of both sides of its mouth and we can use that against them. Um, sometimes we can just point to the lack of clarity in the law. Sometimes we can point to the absence of, um, the fact that we don't need to, under most um, circuit authority, admit, and certainly under Supreme Court authority, admit that we're going to violate the statute. And then the kind of other standing wrinkle is, does this analysis change from the criminal to civil context? So there's, uh, there's this ex parte young argument that I mentioned, but what the, what the parties have done, or the states have done mainly, is kind of put that into a standing argument and said, well, it's not just that, um, you are, need to name a state official who's going to violate the constitution, but you need to be, um, have a reasonable expectation of chill. And there's a different expectation with the enforcement of criminal statutes than civil statutes. And so one of the arguments we faced is that we just can't be chilled by a civil statute. Again, we've now successfully defeated that twice, but that is a, a third variation. The final variation of this and kind of the most noxious, and you're seeing this also in Texas, is that ag -Ag's laws are actually early adopters of this attempt to turn over state power to private citizens. So they moved first from criminal to civil and then moved from civil only enforceable by private parties. And then that became, who do you sue? Um, and can you actually name them? That's, this is exactly what's going on in Arkansas. I'm working with ALDF and I'm a legal defense fund. And Alan, I've been working on this case to kind of argue that you can in fact name private parties if you prove up the right facts. It may very well be that now due to the Texas abortion statute, we have a different way in and we can sue, um, we can sue clerks and other judicial officials. That'll be really exciting if that's true. Um, it does seem like the Supreme Court is reluctant to allow this kind of uh, transfer of power, state power to private officials. But we've seen kind of this whole gamut of standing doctrine kind of come out of the ag laws 
that is important not just for ag gag cases, but I think for these other constitutional challenges that we're seeing crop up. Maybe just to um, add a little bit of detail to the um, the things Dave was laying out about chill standing. So one of the you know one of the things that we have to do um, when we're challenging either a, a you know civil or a criminal statute is to say exactly how the laws target our activities. And from the way that we've sort of been introducing this, that might sound um, like it would be very easy um, or sort of simple, particularly when we have these legislative histories that sh you know show that the laws were intended to target undercover investigations. But actually, in practice, it's more difficult than you might imagine um, because of the way the laws are written. So we not only have to show that you know, we do have this documented history of being able to gain employment at, you know, a Tyson food slaughterhouse or a Nebraska pig breeding operation or a California dairy farm and conducting these uh, these investigations in the manner that we say that we want to in this, you know, in the target state that has an ag, -Ag law. But we also have to say that we reasonably fear that these statutes apply to our conduct. And so that sometimes has, you know, involves making an argument that we have an intent to harm the facility uh, as um, as Alan was describing. And one way that we've you know been able to do that is by focusing in particular on laws that Im sort of explicitly say that one way of you know or, or contain within them a, an intent um, to damage the enterprise or to harm a facility's business or sort of operation. So laws that sort of explicitly focus on the types of reputational harms that um, are almost inevitable, you know, with these undercover investigations that we that we conduct and, and publish. Um, so I could say more about that, but I know we have a lot more to cover, so I'll stop there. Thank you. That's helpful. And maybe just quickly to elaborate on it a little bit, you hinted at this, Kelsey, but does that mean that when challenged on standing ALDF or PETA or any of these groups planning uh, potential future investigations have to allege specifics of planned future investigations in that state? It's varied from state to state. In general, you know, the more specific we can be, the more secure we are. But of course, it's sort of absurd because we're not, you know, we're not going to violate the law. So we're not going to have a highly specific plan to violate the law in a certain way. Um, you know, that just wouldn't make sense from a resource and planning perspective. So our our plans are are concrete in, in the sense that, you know, we've done this before, we have facilities we're interested in, we very much want to go forward, but we're not going to go to the effort of planning a full investigation. And typically courts haven't required that we go that, you know, quite that far. Thank you. Um, and so now that we've covered standing, let's start going into some of the merits of these different cases. We've kind of circled around the First Amendment and the Constitution a lot and spoken about uh, chilling speech. Maybe we could go a little bit more into some of the core First Amendment arguments that not only, you know, the LDF sort of animal advocacy side of things are making, but also what are the most common arguments that these states are using to argue why their agate laws don't violate the First Amendment? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll start as awful though. So we've, we've been working together for so long on these cases, we can all, we can all answer all these specific questions. Um, uh, so one argument is that, um, and this sort of stems from the United States Supreme Court's decision in the United States versus Alvarez, uh, uh, which was decided uh, several years ago, um, that uh, held that, which held that uh, lies cannot be categorically prohibited under the First Amendment. Um, as, uh, so in the, in, in the past, the Supreme Court had sort of hinted that lies never have any First Amendment value uh, because they interfere with the public discourse. They actually distort uh, the public discourse. Um, but what we, and Alvarez basically rejects uh, the idea that the government can ban all lies because there's such a wide spectrum of the types of mistruths that people use for different social, political, uh, and other reasons. And um, instead, Alvarez limits the first, uh, says the First Amendment protects government, uh, protects against government regulation of lies, uh, unless those lies cause a legally cognizable harm or, ta um, or tangible harm. And what we've argued in these cases is that the lies that our, these investigators tell um, 
do not cause any uh, legally cognizable or tangible harm because uh, in fact that they are valuable lies because they in, in sort of the broader sense of First Amendment discourse, uh, they are lies designed to expose the truth. And so thinking of a lot of these types of misrepresentations in a utilitarian sense, uh, that they are uh, mistruths uh, to get access to proper to information that is uh, in the public interest to to be exposed. And so um, we've argued um, that 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 falls in the, into under the First Amendment's protection. And because also they target lies in two different ways that are both are content based. One is they prohibit lies, but not truthful statements. And then they also, in, at least in the uh, states where they focuses on agricultural and, and, and um, facilities, that they're content based in the sense that these are lies only to gain access to those facilities as opposed to nursing homes or child care facilities or hospitals or other places where one might commit, con conduct an undercover investigation. Um, so, and we kind of argue that there's a long history of this type of deception by, the, by undercover journalists, um, by civil rights testers and others um, that, that society recognizes as valuable types of mistruths and to punish them would violate the First Amendment rights of those who would wish to undertake them. Um, in, so I'll sort of couple that with the, the typical response to this on the government's part is um, that these lies do cause tangible or legally cognizable harm in that they facilitate a trespass. Um, and the arguments that the states have made um, is that a, even, a, even if the owner, a, a property owner consents to a, a person being on their property, if that, de, if that consent is achieved through deception, then the consent is invalid, thereby making it a, a, a legally cognizable and actionable harm. Um, and we've argued a couple of things in response to that. One is um, there is actually no harm. Like trespass is basically a strict liability crime where you don't have to show actual damages. And so to, to sort of, and uh, there are all sorts of circumstances, again, uh, that we recognize in society as, uh, uh, as permissible. Uh, a restaurant reviewer lies to get access to a, re a, re a privately owned restaurant in order to do a review um, without revealing their identity. That's a, that if, if, if these, these trespasses are, if these lies are trespasses, then so are those. Uh, and so would be undercover journalists' lies and civil rights testers' lies. Um, so, um, so that's one theory. We also talk about, as I mentioned this a little bit, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, is that the very act of recording or photographing um, matters of public concern, even on private property and even without the consent of a property owner, um, is, a, is also protected speech or conduct for preparatory to free speech um, in the same way that other forms of news gathering uh, has been protected by the First Amendment. So it's not just the actual expression itself that is that the first member protects if the government is permitted to choke off speech before it can ever occur by cutting off access to information uh, then it can effectively censor speech um, at the front end of the, of the sort of speech continuum um, and those are equally important um, so you know um, uh, so, so any kind of ban on recording and we've we've analogized it to the idea like how uh, could you could the government ban uh, uh, taking notes right, uh, by somebody who's access private property about what they're observing. And video recording, we argue, is a simply a high-tech version um, of taking notes uh, and, 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 and documenting or memorializing the uh, misconduct that is being observed. Um, so those are the, those are the I think, am, am, I, am I missing any of the sort of basic, I mean, th those are the arguments of why this is actually speech as opposed to conduct. And that's why the First Amendment applies. Uh, maybe somebody wants to pick it up from there and talk about the content-based and viewpoint-based uh, um, arguments. I think you've sort of touched on the content-based. I, I wanted to sort of add something um, that I think Dave kind of raised, but I just wanted to emphasize. So the laws that target recording also target use of the information so it's gathering you know the data and using it so the, these laws both explicitly target you know the act of recording which is protected speech or speech you know predicate activities but they also target the use which is exactly what you know journalists and animal activists you know intend to do they they're not just going there to record you know footage and put it in a drawer um, so that's another you know way that we argue that the laws um, 
you know, target protected um, First Amendment activity. Um, maybe I'll touch on the viewpoint, um, you, you know, arguments for a moment. So as we've been mentioning, you know, several of these laws, well, all of the laws sort of have this, um, this pedigree or history, you know, legislative history that shows, you know, to, to varying degrees and with, you know, varying um, types of uh, color from the legislators, you know, the, you know, their intention to target animal activists. And so that's one thing that we point to, to argue that the laws are, you know, intended to discriminate, discriminate against the views of um, animal activists and privilege the, you know, the viewpoints of, um, you know, pro-agriculture speakers. But another way that viewpoint discrimination um, operates is in the law's uh, intent requirements. So for example, um, Iowa's second ag gag law and Kansas's ag gag law both um, contain, uh, you know, um, the person has to have, has to do certain activities with the intent to, you know, damage the enterprise or with the intent to cause economic injury to the facility's business or customers. And so um, the way, you know, we, we've sort of said, you know, the state is not only regulating speech in a content content based manner, but also specifically signal is singling out those whose speech has the effect of, you know, causing harm to the reputational harm to the facility while privileging those, you know, the investigators who we gain access in order to write a puff piece about the about the facility or, or laud the facility. Um, so that's I probably um, viewpoint, and I don't know if we're Dave. Do you want to talk a little bit about the sort of trespass arguments that we're we've been facing in North Carolina and in Iowa? If there's anything yeah. else to add there, I'm just going to kind of put what Alan was saying in the reverse format to just kind of explain how the state's approaching this. So we've kind of seen two, and maybe it's worth us pausing to make sure we're all on the same page. Just so First Amendment law, right? Do you have standing? Does the First Amendment apply? What level of scrutiny applies? Do you survive that level of scrutiny? So there's four questions. Um, we kind of we covered standing, and we're kind of covering all three combined in, the, in these responses. And so, to so Alan was talking mainly about the first question: Does the First Amendment apply? And we have all these arguments for why it does. The flip side of that is kind of the the states are asking for new exceptions to the First Amendment. You can kind of conceptualize them in a couple of different ways. One of them we kind of talk about is the speech plus exception, that if speech is added, to, or speech restriction is added to something else, particularly if it's uh, added to something that protects private property, the states think the courts are obsessed with private property of late, um, that, that that is a exempt from the First Amendment. A variation of that, but you know, one that is uh, making a little bit more traction with the courts is if speech occurs on private property, it's exempt from the First Amendment. This is all going to the kind of second question, does the First Amendment apply? And I think Kelsey and Alan have given you very good reasons for why we think these laws are content-based or viewpoint discriminatory. And as I said, you know, the laws almost always fall if that's the case. And so once you kind of win that argument, the last part that this is survive scrutiny is um, actually pretty easy for us. And usually the states don't defend the argument the laws against um, a content-based or viewpoint discriminatory classification. But the one thing I'll add is that we've seen that we can also pretty much concede um, intermediate scrutiny, which is the lowest level of scrutiny that typically applies in First Amendment cases, applies and win. Because what's happened of late is the Supreme Court has said the states need to produce evidence to justify that these speech restrictions are necessary. And either because the states have terrible lawyers or they're lazy, and my guess is it's both, um, the, they just don't ever generate this evidence as part of the legislative record. And so we've often found that while Kelsey and Alan are absolutely right, that we can win by kind of getting the right classification, our alternative is to kind of assume the state's classification intermediate scrutiny, and we nonetheless think we can prevail there. So actually a lot of our action happens under the, does the First Amendment apply question, because once you get by that, the states really have a lot less traction. Thank you, David. That's really helpful. It's signposting the different parts of the analysis that, that we'd have to go through. So I appreciate that. Uh, can you speak a little bit maybe to, just for people who might not have taken constitutional law yet, um, what levels of scrutiny are applied or could be applied here and what do each of those require the defendants to show? 
Todd, you're the professor, so I'll let you go first. <laughs> Um, so the um, uh, we so if if a law is regulates based on the content of the speech or the viewpoint of the speaker, then the court typically applies strict scrutiny, which just the burden to the state to show that the law is narrowly tailored or necessary to serve a compelling governmental interest. Um, and that narrow, narrow tailoring requirement also requires that the state show that there were no less discriminatory alternatives that could have accomplished the same. Uh, objectives. So that's obviously the highest standard uh, in, in any area of constitutional law and the toughest one for the state uh, to meet. Um, the intermediate scrutiny standard, which um, is the alternative uh, standard, is that the law be narrowly tailored to serve an important governmental interest um, and leaves the law leaves open ample alternative channels of communication. So Although the words, uh, the both tests use the phrase narrowly tailored, the one in strict scrutiny is much, uh, much stricter, but as uh, Dave allu alluded to, the Supreme Court has um, tr tried to put a little bit of more, more teeth in the intermediate scrutiny standard by showing that the states at least thought about or considered evidence of other ways that they could have restricted, uh, advanced their interests. Um, so basically what we've argued is, um, so first of all, as, as uh, Dave points out there, we don't always get a clear answer from the state about what their interests are. So there are vague uh, assertions of private property interests. Going, so we're going back to the trespass uh, issues. Sometimes there's an allusion to the privacy of uh, slaughterhouses or factory farms um, or the people who work uh, in, in those facilities. Um, in uh, Utah, um, the uh, I think that there was a there, there was a con uh, assertion that there were going to be transmission of zoonotic diseases. And so there, uh, that, this, that is investigators would be um, actually causing more risk to health and food safety than actually what they were trying to uncover. Um, but there's very little in the records in most of these cases, the states don't put any evidence in or they haven't. Um, and so these are kind of just generalized assertions of the state interest. Um, and then uh, the narrow tailoring is where we sort of do most of the work. we we'll say, well, what, so first of all, is your interest important enough to justify restriction on speech? Uh, and even if it is, um, could you could you advance those interests uh, with other measures? So other safety sort of st safety standards, for example, uh, that would um, uh, that would satisfy the state's interest without infringing on the speech of the investigators. And just to so one of the one of the early sort of um, quotes from the cases that I remember, I think it was the Utah case. Um, the judge wrote something like what the what this law appears perfectly tailored to is stopping undercover investigations. And that is very we've, you know, been able to really show that, you know, the purposes the the, the main purpose that the laws are serving is is stopping investigations and stopping speech and that they're um, both under and, and um, over inclusive in terms of furthering the purported, you know, motives of the legislature. And just to jump in here really fast, the one interesting thing to me that we haven't seen as much of is playing more with the kind of reasonable time, place, and manner restriction aspect of the First Amendment. So most First Amendment laws are always subject to heightened scrutiny, more than rational basis, either, either um, intermediate or strict. There are exceptions to that, or kind of you get more towards reasonless review with what are known as time, place, and manner restrictions. And, you know, like, because most government attorneys are just, you know, poorly paid corporate defense attorneys, right? Their main job is to sow confusion. And so the, I, what we, I think it's a pretty easy way to, um, to sow confusion to say these are reasonable time, place and manner restrictions. We've seen the states pay, play with that a little bit, but we haven't seen as much of it as I think I thought we would have up to this point. And I do think that may be in a place we see them going, not because it's right, it's just 100% wrong as a matter of law, but it just, it is a way to kind of make the law seem more complicated and this whole, uh, this whole analysis seem, um, you know, more in their favor. Thank you. And that perfectly kind of leads us into where I think we'll go next about how these laws have evolved and may continue to evolve. But one final question while we're talking about uh, the Constitution is, Obviously, we're focusing on the First Amendment, but are there other constitutional issues that these laws raise? And if so, are those being sort of argued in any of your cases as well? 
Well, when we when we first started, we um, uh, we we tried to make some uh, gain some ground by arguing there was an equal protection problem with these laws, also in that they were based on and again uh, the legislative history uh, of many of these statutes is um, is as colorful as Kelsey said. Uh, is, uh, is some of the stuff that they the legislators say about extremist vegans and other types of pejorative phrases that they use to get the laws, uh, to get the votes to pass these laws um, are, are kind of entertaining. So we basically focused on the idea that there was an, uh, a clear sense of animus against animal rights groups um, and people who advocate for the interests of animals. Um, that was, that, that is, didn't gain a lot of traction in the earlier cases. We have been, um, uh, some cases, some courts just avoided deciding because they decided on First Amendment grounds. So that was one alternative theory. Um, we tried to make some, early, in the early cases, also some preemption arguments. We argued that federal uh, Meat Inspection Act and other federal laws that regulate commercial agriculture um, might basically uh, preempt the state's efforts to, to, to impose these restrictions. And those have basically not really uh, gained a lot of traction uh, either. Uh, and then the last thing is, this, and this is still a First Amendment theory, uh, but it's a different one than what we've been talking about, is um, that these laws are unconstitutionally overbroad, uh, that they sweep in so much, even if there are certain types of speech that could be legitimately restricted by the legislature in these contexts, that they don't, they, that they reach far beyond that to focus on uh, political speech or speech that, that leads to um, uh, information that's in the public interest. So. Um, and those 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 claims have uh, we're still bringing. They they tend to be sort of an alternative theory, and and the courts have not really. Uh, uh, so Kansas, for example, the court did not reach that this, uh, that issue because they had invalidated it on straight First Amendment grounds. So. One of the interesting things about the preemption argument, though, is we're now seeing it thrown back at us. So as the laws have gotten broader, and they just gotten poorly more poorly written. The state's response is, well, it can't be read that broadly because that'd be, that'd be preemptive. And, you know, at, at the point that doesn't, again, the statutory interpretation make a lot of sense, right? When the state writes something that broadly, it doesn't mean it's, it doesn't mean, oh, we were expecting it to be preempted. It means it wrote a bad law. But um, if that actually were to gain some traction on the defense side, that would reopen our, our preemption arguments on our side. Thank you all for that as well. Um, so I'm trying to be cognizant of time, making sure we've got plenty for, for Q&A at the end. So moving on to something that all of you have touched on already about some of the colorful language that happens in the legislative history. And as Alan just said, trying to get these passed by alluding to wild vegans and eco-terrorists and all that kind of stuff. Um, could, could you briefly discuss the influence of the industrial animal lobby and why are these laws being passed? What justification is there for them being passed? And you know, I know you're all litigators, so maybe this is a better question for, for government affairs folks, but what's being done to try and combat them from passing in the first place? Very concerted. I mean, in the 2010s, especially, you know, sort of an all hands on deck approach, uh, coalition of all different organizations, certainly tons of animal protection organizations coming together, but also, as Dave mentioned, you know, veterans organizations and um, those concerned with elder abuse. So yeah, we, we, you know, the, the story we haven't really been telling is how successful we were in stopping more ag ag laws from passing than even did. Um, so that was, you know, a whole other fight that, um, that, you know, we're still fighting, but is mostly, um, mostly in the past, thankfully. <laughs> I think some of our early successes in the litigation also uh, gave, gave pause to some legislatures um, who might have been otherwise enacted them or would might have seriously considered them. I think they were waiting to see how some of the litigation fell out before they moved forward. But I think it, I mean, to, to sort of the point about the laws going from specific to general, I think it speaks to the power of the ag lobby in these states that they were able to get laws passed that essentially criminalize whistleblowing throughout all industries. You know, that's pretty shocking. Um, and I think it speaks to you know, just how powerful this lobby is in these, especially in these key states. Definitely. Um, some of the later versions of the law that you all have discussed is definitely a little bit shocking to hear, like you said, just how powerful it is that they're getting these passed. 
Um, and it sounds like in response to winds, states that are passing either updated laws or new laws are definitely changing in response to, to this litigation. Maybe as we start to get towards the close and the Q&A, could you all update us on what's been happening just very recently? Because I know there was a flurry of decisions in August and then there's been even more um, updates since then. So where is the state of the ag field today? I guess I'll field that one. Um, uh, just this a uh, couple of hours ago. Uh, so uh, we, uh, uh, we won, we won a, gr a great victory in the 10th circuit in the Kansas ag ag litigation. And um, uh, today we received a cert petition from the state of Kansas. So they're asking the U.S. Supreme Court to review the between the 10th, the 8th, and the 9th circuits, um, boot the, basically the Idaho, um, Iowa, and, and, and Kansas case, uh, litigation is of our attention right now. Um, and uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the most recent North Carolina cases are going forward after a bunch of uh, procedural maneuvering by this uh, and attempts to get interlocutory appeals uh, by the state. Um, and those are going forward now. Uh, more, uh, more, well, the Arkansas case is going forward on the merits. Um, Dave just argued the North Carolina case on, 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 on appeal uh, on the merits in the Fourth Circuit. So still you know, lots of cases to come, I think. Uh, we, we've sort of been, uh, one of the things uh, that we've had to deal with is, um, and anytime you litigate in the against the government, there's, it's like a moving target. And so I think we are now litigating the third or fourth version of the Iowa ag gag laws because each time we get a court decision that's favorable, the legislature goes back into session and tries to tinker with it to try to circumvent the court's decisions and, and try to but, but, but effectively still um, squelch animal investigations. Well, one thing I want to kind of highlight, particularly as we're running out of time, is we've given you a lot of technical legal answers, but I do want to take a big step back. This is by my count, the group of attorneys who have been working on this and organizations that have been working on this are around getting 25 different decisions on dispositive motions in these various cases. And this is a group of people who have worked together for now eight years. I mean, more than public justice was involved, my organization was involved in this before I got involved. And, you know, Kelsey and Alan and I have been working on this essentially the entire time I've been at this or at my organization, right? This is a real story of collective effort in a way that I don't think is easily replicatable. And I think is something that I think is really worth noting and kind of in terms of continued fight is a real example of how we've been able to continue that fight. I really um, appreciate the kind of friendship and collegiality from these other people on the call with us today. And, you know, I think it's, I don't want that to get lost in kind of our talk about, well, there's this thing and that thing, and we may win, we may not. It's a real, this is a real success story, regardless of how the, um, how the cases turn out. It's largely due to kind of the working relationships of the orgs and people you're hearing from. Very much appreciate that. I'd echo that 100%. <laughs> one, of, one of the greatest professional experiences and personal experiences of my career. That is just a wonderful, positive place to, I think, kind of end this part of the conversation and maybe transition to Q&A. And it's just great to hear that from all three of you. Um, so to get the ball rolling, and please, if you have questions, feel free to raise your hand, type them in the chat, just uh, however you want to voice your questions if you're in the audience. Um, there's obviously a number of students here in the audience and who will watch the recording later. All three of you work in the, the animal, First Amendment, food law space. What are things students could be doing now to beyond attending this this wonderful panel get involved, um, stay informed about what's going on in this field and um, participate in their own way? There's many, many ways. Um... We have many uh, wonderful resources through our animal law program for um, students interested in animal law. Those range from everything, you know, and everything from speaker, um, you know, invitations to films you can screen to um, conferences that we hold on a yearly and, and regular basis. Um, we uh, offer um, externships, summer clerkships, and we encourage uh, graduating students to apply 
to do fellowships with us as Michael will be doing next year. Um, so yeah, well, there's many, many ways to get involved in, in animal law and um, I'm happy to chat with anyone um, who wants to learn more about them. Well, ALDF does have uniquely well-developed resources on this. And so I really encourage you to take Kelsey up on that. Public Justice also hosts externs and um, fellows. And you know, I'm happy to talk to people, but if you're really interested in animal law, ALDF has a kind of unique position in terms of connecting with students. I also, as someone who is late to the game on this kind of work, I started as a consumer attorney, I will tell you that you don't have to know all the answers right now, but if you do know where you're going, you've got great resources. Thank you all. And yes, I've definitely personally been very appreciative of everything ALDF does for students. Um, I put in the chat, but the GW Student Animal Legal Defense Fund will be holding an internship and job panel on December 2nd. So if you're in the audience and interested, definitely come to that. Um, if there's any questions from the audience, please raise your hand, chime in. But if not, I, I have more questions. I'm happy to keep asking if no one else does. Um, one thing that came to mind while we were talking earlier is you know, we, we talked a lot about undercover employment investigations, you know, where someone physically is going into the factory farm that we're talking about. But I've definitely seen on YouTube and other places, uh, drone footage or sort of, you know, other versions of investigations where someone's not physically going on the property. How, how would a drone investigation or drone footage be implicated by ag, -AG laws? I think uh, Idaho actually passed a, a drone uh, restriction statute um, in light of our, our success striking down the, the ag law. Well, in that case, I'm actually not quite sure about the timing, but um, yeah, I think that, so the next question is, you know, th these sort of compact video recorders have been a key to the success of a lot of undercover investigations. And so the question, I, it's a good question, like what is, what is the next generation of technology going to bring? Uh, that can provide uh, tools of access uh, to, to, and to news gathering and to political activism. Uh, drones would be one way. I think we're going to see more and more legislative responses to that. Um, I can't remember the, uh, the there's several, several states have put, imposed uh, drone restrictions. Some of them are fairly broad. Um, some of them are basically saying you can't record, uh, photograph or video from a drone. Uh, any place that would not be otherwise accessible uh, to camera to to recording, um, I think a, one or two states actually focus on on ag property, commercial ag property. I can't remember. Maybe maybe Idaho is one of those. Maybe my, maybe Kelsey or Dave has a better memory. So what's interesting about drones and ag is that after 9/11, ag facilities got designated as essential property or something like that. I'm, I'm blanking on the actual legal term. And so, but basically there are, they're recognized as special protections from um, flyovers. And so it actually is easier for the state to restrict drone access just over an ag facility. We have seen some of these broader statutes. And so a colleague of mine at Public Justice, for instance, is representing the National Press Photographers Association in a challenge against the Texas law, which is broader than just that. But unique ag drone statutes actually have some real complications to them. The flip side of that is, in some ways, the preemption arguments are better. The um, FAA does have very explicit drone rules, and to the extent the state's interfering with those, um, the preemption argument would be much stronger than kind of our um, environmental commentary arguments that we can argue for the basis for preemption in the outer ag, ag, ag space. I guess I'll just add not about the law, but just about the use of drones as an advocacy tool, you know, I think it's hard for the public to get their sort of wrap their mind around the scale of animal agriculture. So I think one way that that's been done quite effectively is, um, you know, aerial footage of, for example, you know, a calf ranch that has 10,000 calves in tiny hutches, you know, it really gives you a scale. Um, and also, to give the public an understanding of, of these manure lagoons and sort of what they look like and how close they are to waterways and houses, you know, to sort of give the public a, a sense of how this environmental catastrophe of factory farming, you know, happens. So given that it's an important advocacy tool, I would expect it to be targeted. I, I would just quickly add that um, this is not a technological development, but the pandemic actually 
I think in the conditions and, and slaughterhouses and fa factory farms because of um, the exposed to um, by many of the major agricultural firms in the United States. And so, uh, what you know, the, uh, is going on in these facilities? They're they're a black box to most people, and that's why these investigations are so. Important. Thank you. Um, any questions from anyone else in the audience? And we got a, a wonderful note in the chat in case our speakers didn't see that from a 1L here at GW who just thanking all of you for, for being here. And I definitely echo that. I think this has been a wonderful panel. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I'll let our speakers and everyone else go and enjoy the rest of their afternoon. But if there are any, please chime in. All right, well, uh, then we're a little after four, so I will let everyone go and enjoy the rest of their day. But huge thank you to all three of our panelists and speakers, as well as to uh, G the GW Environmental Energy Law Program and the American Constitution Society for helping co-sponsor this event. Uh, I'm glad that it was well attended and people enjoyed it. We'll definitely be sharing the recording in the next few days. And one more sort of final time virtual round of applause to our three speakers for, for coming and joining and telling us all about this. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Okay.